the first time I heard uh, Mr. LaRue speak, and he came onto campus, and this was probably December of 1971. So it was several months after Nixon had ended the Bretton Woods system, taking the dollar off of the gold, monetized gold measurement. And uh, LaRouche came in and he simply said that um, this action on the part of Nixon uh, has tilted the entire global situation. We're now headed into a period where productive investment will be destroyed and where everything will be oriented towards looting, towards gambling, speculative activity, and that this represented a revival of fascism with a liberal face or a liberal veneer. Uh, it, it would be hard to put enough emphasis on the impact that that alone had. It set off a course of action and, you know, LaRouche's view was that once that decision was made, once the plunge was made and early efforts to try to walk back from it were defeated, um, it was virtually an inevitability that the system was doomed and that a crash was coming. The trajectory from that moment on, you could almost say that the trajectory that began with the killing of John F. Kennedy and the cover-up of it, uh, was set in motion. And so it played out over a longer period of time. You could probably fairly say that the events that began in August of 1971 reached another major inflection point uh, much later in the 1980s when you had the whole 1987 stock market crash, which was a manifestation of the course that had been set back in 1971. So you had the Carter presidency brought us very much to the brink of a potential thermonuclear war. Uh, this was something that LaRouche warned about in a prophetic and really historic uh, presidential campaign television broadcast on the eve of the 1976 elections that basically said with people like Brzezinski and the whole trilateral commission running around, there was a very real danger that we, we were going to basically take actions that would provoke a thermonuclear war. And that was really a critical point in terms of putting LaRouche on the map here in the United States among a very large group of World War II veterans, people from his own generation, who saw in him somebody who was a potential leading figure to help recast the politics of the United States. But you had, again, in the early 1980s, a further erosion of the financial system. Uh, you have the Graham Rudman bill and then a succession of other bills that basically eliminated all of the protective regulations that prevented offshore banks from doing business in the United States. We were in the middle of a political fight at that time where a number of leading members of Congress who were adamantly opposed to this further deregulation and really further criminalization of the banking system were targeted by the FBI to be framed up and driven out of Congress. We worked very closely with Senator Harrison Williams, who was one of the leading members in the Senate opposed to the next round of deregulation. And when that round went through, it meant that offshore banks and even non-bank financial institutions could partner up with big Wall Street banks and could basically launder criminal pro proceeds. There was no limitation any longer, no protection at the border, if you will, of the U.S. banking system. That was another, you know, gigantic ratchet downward. After 1987, Alan Greenspan came in as chairman of the Federal Reserve, and he had been part of a group at J.P. Morgan several years earlier 
who had designed a plan for eliminating Glass-Steagall. And from 1987, when Greenspan replaced Paul Volcker as chairman of the Fed, it took a decade until the late 1990s before they could actually pull it off. And so you had, in the late 1990s, another inflection point centered around three things. The attack on uh, Bill Clinton's presidency through the impeachment sham. You had the beginnings of the unraveling of the global financial system with what was nominally referred to as the Asia crisis of 1997 and 1998. And in the midst of all of that, with Clinton badly weakened as president, you had Greenspan and Citibank and other Wall Street institutions ramming through by 1999 the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Now we're getting into much shorter spans of time between the inflection points because with the repeal of Glass-Steagall, everything went haywire in the U.S. banking system and what little protections remained, at least there was nominally a separation of commercial banking from the gambling den. That formally ended and it only took seven years before a humongous financial bubble was built up. And in 2007, the real estate part of that bubble blew out. And then that led directly into September of 2008, when you had the Lehman Brothers incident, basically signaling that the whole system was completely bankrupt. And rather than an orderly reorganization in bankruptcy and a return to Glass-Steagall, which Mr. LaRouche proposed at the time through the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act, which had a lot of traction in Congress. Instead, you got the $23.7 trillion bailout of Wall Street, which has been the next big inflection point downward. We're still living in the aftermath of that 2007-2008 collapse and around 2010, the process that had already begun to really unravel here hit Europe as well. So that since that point, the entire transatlantic system has been on a near-term collision course. And the methods that have been used here in the US and in Europe to basically postpone the day of reckoning has been simply to produce a wall of money to where the unregulated derivatives traffic right now, the active present derivative contracts internationally are somewhere in the range of 1.7 to 1.9 quadrillion dollars. I don't think that the uh, screen would be wide enough to show all the zeros that you've got to put together to convey this idea of 1.7 to 1.9 quadrillion dollars. That's a thousand trillion dollars. So you have this bubble that is so many orders of magnitude larger than the productive economy of the world, and particularly with Europe and the United States shrinking, you know, in absolute terms. This bubble is the biggest bubble in history. It's unpayable. And so we're really right now, I think, sitting on the edge of what you could say is the final downshift and the final death throes of this system. It's really only a question of time when some particular set of circumstances trigger the blowout.